Blair. We can get started. Welcome everyone to the final lecture of the series. We made it. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the ride so far. Excellent. It's a, a very exciting time to talk about gravitational wave astronomy, so I'm really glad all of you have uh, managed to come to these lectures. Uh, so, as always, please don't hesitate to interrupt, ask questions throughout, and uh, if we get off the rails, I'll try to get us back on. Uh, today, I am going to summarize the lecture series by giving you the rest of the details, talking about all of the, the exciting things, at least the things that excite me, about our detection, GW150914. I gave you a, a quick uh, taste of some of the details on the very first lecture, but I haven't gone into detail, and so this, this lecture... Could you feel that light? The, uh, the one right above your head. Oh, that one was never on. Yeah, good. All right, we good? Yeah. All right, so I will give you the rest of the details, the things that excite me about GW 1509 14, why it has triggered an exciting era of astronomy, and I will answer any remaining questions you may have about it. Uh, if I don't get to them during these slides, please don't hesitate to ask. All right, so we have our gravitational wave network here, our network of ground-based detectors, LIGO and Virgo, the ones that have been getting all the attention so far, but more to come, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So the advanced LIGO detectors, the, the final uh, iteration of these ground-based detectors in the US, uh, came online. Uh, September was about when it came online. This is the behavior of the, tech, of the detectors during the first 16 days of coincident observation, those first 16 days of data that we've published so far. Uh, up here, just the, showing you again where those, those uh, detectors are located. We have one in Livingston, Louisiana, one in Hanford, Washington. Their orientations are about a 90 degree rotation off from one another, and they are separated by about 10 milliseconds of light travel time. And so that gives us our baseline for trying to localize gravitational wave sources. Uh, here's a quick schematic of the detector, which you've heard a whole lot about at this point. And then up here is our sensitivity curve. So this is showing the level of noise, the amplitude of the noise, as a function of frequency from 20 to about 1,000 hertz. And so this bucket here, this is our peak sensitivity, right around 100 hertz. And so that, this, this is showing you just how sensitive we were. These are about down to 10 to the minus 23 in strains, about the sensitivity we achieved uh, during those first 16 days. Another way to uh, quantify how sensitive our detectors were is to ask how far away could we have seen a particular source. So this is just showing you the strain uh, of the noise. This is showing you the maximum distance we could have detected a compact binary up to, specifically one like GW150914. So on the y-axis here is the distance in megaparsecs. Uh, right down here is the actual distance that we detected uh, GW 150914 at, which is about 410 megaparsecs. But these curves here, in blue is the Livingston detector and in red is the Hanford detector, you can see that we could have actually seen a source like GW 150914 out to about 2 gigaparsecs, 2,000 megaparsecs. So that gives you an idea of how close by this was compared to how far we could have actually detected it and why that signal was so loud in our data. And then right here, this dashed line, that is when we detected GW150914. So if you look, that's pretty, so everywhere these, uh, there's no points here for these curves, is a time where the detectors were not in lock. So they were down being maintained for whatever reason. That's scarily close to the uh, very start of some segment of data. So we got incredibly lucky in so many ways with this detection. But overall, during the full observing run, the detectors were operating beautifully, and we could have seen things like GW150914 at some very far distances. All right, so GW150914, you've seen this before. This is showing you the signal that we found in the data. On the top is showing the data, on the left from the Hanford detector, and on the right from the Livingston detector, uh, with as little, thank you very much, with as little uh, touching of the data as possible. So we often, uh, so you learned all about data analysis techniques in a previous lecture if you came. Uh, and the, we have to use a lot of sophisticated techniques to analyze the data coming out of the detectors. And we have to rely heavily on our models for what these gravitational waves look like to pull them out of the data. Usually the amplitude of that signal, uh, here's a, an example of one, usually the amplitude of that signal is far, far below the noise. And so we need to have that robust signal model to pull it out of the data, to pull that needle out of the haystack. This one was an exception. This one, the signal amplitude was so high compared to the noise that 
you don't even need to do anything special to the data. We basically just take a chunk of data, look at it, and it's there. You can hear it with headphones, you can see it by eye in the data. It's amazing. So that is the detection. The next row down are our reconstructions. There's two different reconstructions there, and I'll show a bigger picture of that in a second. Um, but how we recover that signal depends a little bit on the analysis that we use to do it. Um, we have our modeled searches, the ones that use those strong models for what the compact binary gravitational wave should look like. Um, that's shown in the, the more narrow band, and I'll zoom in on that in a second. But we also have our unmodeled searches, those burst-like searches that are meant to be a safety net to catch the things that we didn't expect, to catch the things that we can't describe well with models, like supernova explosions. The signal was so loud that even those unmodeled searches could pull out the signal with high fidelity. They could pull it out very, very accurately. Down here shows the data after we subtract our best fit for what that signal looks like, so it should just look like noise, and it does. And then finally, this is showing the spectrograms of the data. So this is showing that chirp structure we're looking for <coughs> on that binary and spiral. On the y-axis is frequency, on the x-axis is time. Early times, we're at low frequencies, and then as we go to later and later times, as we get towards the merger of those two objects, it shoots up in frequency and we get that nice chirp with the loud amplitude that we're looking for. So you've heard all about our analysis techniques. Any questions before I go into them? Why is uh, Louisiana so much uh, quieter? Louisiana quieter. Yeah, on the right there, it's not as intense on the spectrum. Ah, right? uh, yeah. So the the Livingston detector is a bit more noisy than the Hanford one. Okay. So the the amplitude gets a little bit less, mm -hmm. and, and so there's also second order effects. There's a there's weaker effects that come into play with um, where the signal happened to be, where the source happened to fall with respect to that antenna pattern. Oh, yeah. So it's not equally sensitive in all directions. We have that peanut-shaped antenna pattern. And so where on the sky it happens to be, because those antenna patterns for the two detectors are slightly misaligned, that can play into amplitudes as well. But this is largely driven just by a slightly noisier detector. Um, it's, it's in a swamp in Louisiana where there's logging going on all around the site. So it, it's just a much more noisy environment than the desert where Hanford is. Yes? Um, I nerds, but what kind of interference do you get from power lines? I mean, you know, all kinds of high frequency uh, problems there. And am I totally wrong? I mean, no, no. So the, if you look, here's 100, 90, yeah. 80, 70, 60, boom, there's that spike at 60 oh, hertz. It, it is already, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, so we're the yeah. electric background is a serious problem. Yeah, exactly. So the alternating current supplied to our detectors oscillates at 60 hertz. That causes a huge spectral line in our data. And then we have harmonics of that at higher and lower frequencies, multiples of that frequency, that also show up as lines in that data. So yeah, that, the, the spectral component of the, of the noise is really the dominant effect. So Thank you. For a compact binary coalescence, it's because we sweep through the frequency band of the detectors. Those don't affect us too much. Okay. They just cut out very, very, very narrow notches in our, in our signal, and it doesn't really affect our ability to Thank you Where those matter a lot are the continuous wave sources. So if we're looking for a 60 hertz gravitational wave, that gets really hard. Yeah. Yes? And the 10 milliseconds like traveling time. Yes. They are only important if the source of the gravitational wave is not perpendicular to the... That's right. So the 10 millisecond travel time is basically a maximum delay that we would expect from a gravitational wave. If we would have been totally... If it, yeah, in, like in line with the two detectors, then we would have seen a 10 millisecond delay time. It was, so the delay time is about 7 milliseconds for GW 15.09.14. Oh, 7 is quite a bit. Yeah, so it, so it is off to the side. Uh, most, because our detectors are more sensitive above and below them, we expect most of the signals to actually be coming from above and below with very small uh, delay times and arrival. But GW 15 on 14 was a bit of an exception. It was kind of off on the side and had a, a 7 millisecond delay between the <coughs> That 10 milliseconds gives us an upper bound. So if, if we happen to think, if we think we detected a gravitational wave, but we see a delay time between Hanford and, and Livingston of, say, 12 milliseconds, then we know it's not a gravitational wave. Is there uh, any useful information to be derived from overlapping the noise from the two detectors? Um, so, yeah, how we overlap them uh, depends on where we think the source was. So, you can pick a, a spot on the sky, and that tells you basically how you can coherently combine that data and look at noise properties. Um, so, that's a, a step that we don't really do explicitly. Uh, when we do the full uh, characterization of the signal, we model all of the data self-consistently, and so that kind of takes into account any correlations that happen in the data. Um, as far as noise sources go, we don't expect any noise sources to be correlated. Uh, between detectors. We, um, it's hard to think of noise sources that would happen simultaneously, simultaneously in Hanford and Livingston. Um, there are some, 
which we've started looking into, and we've done we've done uh, checks to make sure that they didn't really affect us too much. But uh, you could imagine very very strong lightning strikes can cause some electromagnetic propagation in the atmosphere. It could cause some kind of coherent noise source where you have something happen in both detectors that's related to the same exact source of noise. Um, but we've done lots and lots of checks to make sure that those aren't affecting our, our measurements. <coughs> All right. So the, just to give you a quick refresher on what our compact binary analysis pipeline looks like, uh, on minutes, we have our online detection. That's what pulled that signal out of the data within a matter of minutes and got us really looking at the data, making sure that we didn't accidentally inject the signal like we do all the time. Um, and from the, the data products of that online detection, we get an interesting time in the data. So we, we say that there's something interesting happening in both detectors at this time. From that information, from the arrival time at the two detectors and the relative amplitudes, we can try to localize where that source came from uh, on the sky as quickly as possible. So it's not the best localization we can do, but it's fast. And so we do that on the order of minutes, and we send our maps <laughs> off to electromagnetic partners to point their telescopes to look for possible electromagnetic counterparts to that gravitational wave signal. And then on much longer time scales, we do that coherent, full modeling of the data that I just mentioned, where we take days to robustly extract as much information as we possibly can from the data and get all of the uh, parameters estimated for that compact binary, the masses, the spins of the black holes, uh, better estimates of the sky location, how far away it was, the orientation, all those kinds of things. And then also in those kinds of timescales is where we really evaluate how significant we think the source is, and that ultimately drives whether we decide to publish or not. So the online detection, you've seen this before, just a quick refresher in case you missed the lecture. The way that we evaluate significance, we want to ask how often do we expect noise in the two detectors to unluckily come together to fool us into thinking we've detected a gravitational wave. So there's glitches that happen in the instruments all the time. They can often look like gravitational wave signals from compact binaries. And we want to know how often does that happen in a way, in a delay less than 10 milliseconds between the two instruments, at some signal to noise ratio, some loudness. Uh, how often does noise conspire to fool us into thinking we've detected a gravitational wave? And the way we do that is through what we call time slides. So here's data, if you imagine data collected in time from Hanford and Livingston, a gravitational wave is going to cause a trigger in both detectors at about the same time, within 10 milliseconds of one another. Um, but there's also lots of noise, lots of things that could look like if we just looked at one detector's data, look like gravitational waves. So those happen at random times, usually not within 10 milliseconds of one another. But we can artificially slide that data in time and look how often we have those things line up. There we slid a little bit, we got that one to line up, we slid a little bit more, those two line up, so on. And we can build up a huge collection of false triggers, false gravitational wave signals in artificial data and ask how often do they happen to look like a signal that we want to evaluate the significance of. So GW150914 was really loud. We don't just take into account how often glitches line up to look like signals. We also take into account how loud they are, how well they match our templates, our signal models. We get a lot of, uh, a lot of significance out just from having a very, very loud detection. So GW150914 had a huge signal to noise ratio. There's not many uh, glitches that happen in the, data, in the data that look like that. So it takes a lot of time slides. We have to simulate many, many, many years of advanced LIGO operation to have noise conspire to fool us into thinking we have a detection like GW150914. Yes? With, with respect to the signal that you're getting, as, as far as the random events are concerned, yeah. is the waveform different? Yes. The waveform is different. Yes. In so, okay. So the, the even though they line up, the waveform is different. That's right. So if you were, we there's a huge range of possible signals we expect out of uh, out, out of the local universe. Uh, a huge range in com uh, compact binary masses, for example. We search through our data with this big template bank, which I've shown in previous lectures, where we just span the whole possible parameter space. We make all the possible signals we think we could detect. And we comb through the data with that. And so we look for not only uh, coincidences in time between the two detectors, but coincidences in recovered parameters. So it needs to be the same exact model waveform, the same exact template with the same exact masses that rings off in both detectors to fool us into thinking an actual detection. Thank you. Uh, but the noise is so mean that it does actually happen fairly often uh, for low level signals, for low signal to noise signals. Can you quantify when you say it's a huge? Can you quantify the numbers or? For, you mean for GW150914 versus standard signals? Against the noise, you said that the, 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 the 
Yes. Yeah, so so um, random fluctuations in our noise cause signal to noise ratio events of eight or so all the time. So that's about the level of our noise. It's about a signal to noise ratio of eight with our templates. GW150914 was about 24. So it, it was loud. <laughs> And so to simulate, to, to figure out exactly how significant we should make that, how, how confident we should be in that detection, that's loud, but how loud? Um, the, the way that we quantify that is we do all those time slides, we simulate lots and lots and lots of years of advanced LIGO operation, and we wait until we get something that looks like it, something with that signal-to-noise ratio in a consistent manner between the two detection, uh, between the two, net, uh, the two instruments in the network. We ask how many years of advanced LIGO do we need to simulate to do that, and for GW15 and 0914, we needed 200,000 years of advanced LIGO operation to come close to expecting noise to conspire to look like that signal. So we would need to operate for 200,000 years to have noise be that mean to look like GW15 0914. And this is the figure that shows that. This is straight from our discovery paper. This is showing a cumulative distribution. So if you start from this side, we are looking at the, this black line here is the, are, are all of the events that are caused by those time slides. So all of the things that fool us into thinking they would be gravitational wave events. Uh, and this is as a function of this x-axis here is signal-to-noise ratio. So we start off with really, really high signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, GW 150914 is over here at around 24. Mm. Uh, there's no background over there. There's no, uh, in the 200,000 years of time slides that we did, we did not have a single event that looked like GW 150914. As we go to lower signal-to-noise ratio, we start counting some events. We had some events happen with around a signal-to-noise ratio of 20. If we simulated 200,000 years of advanced LIGO, we could see some noise events that happened around 18 to 20 uh, signal-to-noise ratio. And then as we go to lower signal-to-noise ratio, you see it climb up quickly, and then down near that eight signal-to-noise ratio, you can see our noise is kind of <coughs> becoming dominant. So down there, we would be very, uh, we, we are not very confident in the detections we may have down around signal-to-noise ratio of eight. But at 24, it's a pretty solid detection. And so that's what this uh, figure is showing. And then the one event that doesn't get all the attention, this one steals all the attention, is LVT 15, 10, 12. And so we called it LVT for LIGO Virgo Trigger. Uh, we weren't confident enough to give it the GW uh, <coughs> designation, which GW 150914 got. But that signal right there is the second most significant event in the 16 days of data that we've published so far. It's entirely consistent with the gravitational wave event. Um, it, it doesn't have any, there's no particular noisy aspects to the data at the time. All the environmental channels look pretty clean. It's just a low signal to noise ratio. And we know that we don't, uh, we don't expect, uh, we do expect the, the noise in the instruments to cause this kind of events every so often. So we can say maybe one per century, once per century noise can conspire to give us events like LPT 15, 10, 12. So that's why we didn't really claim it as this gold plated detection with the confidence that we had for GW150914, but it's interesting. And we're gonna have a lot more like that where we're not going to be 100% certain that it's a signal or if it's noise. And so we need to take that into account when we start doing more robust, more uh, uh, widespread estimates of the behavior of compact binaries. If we wanna learn about the population that we're starting to detect, figure out the distributions of masses for black holes, we want to take into account that information. We want to do it in a way that we fold in our uncertainty in those signals, but we want to take advantage of all those low-level signals. All right, so that was the detection, and then we move on to that full parameter estimation, the full forward modeling of the data, where we try to extract as much information out as we possibly can. And so the way that we do that is we go back to the drawing board. We forget, besides knowing the time in the data where the signal was, we forget everything that those searches told us about the signal and we start from scratch, and we build up a full, uh, self-consistent recovery of the signal in the two detectors. So here's Hanford and here's Livingston. Uh, you can see the signal uh, in the background, and that white is the data uh, for both detectors, and then in red and cyan are the reconstructions that we get out of doing that full forward modeling of the data. And so this is the, uh, basically the 90% bounds of what that signal looks like in the data based on those analyses. So we can zoom in on it here. So, on the, tap, on the top is Hanford, on the bottom is Livingston, and I had mentioned the two different types of recovery we did for GW150914. We had our, our modeled, strong modeled search where we, where we assumed it's a compact binary signal and we tried to pull out the signal. That model, that strong model, gives us tighter uh, bounds on what the signal could be, and so in cyan is, that, is the result of that analysis. So you can see this really narrow strip of the reconstructed signal. But then we can say, okay, well, let's not assume any type of morphology for the signal. We don't know that it's a compact binary. We just think that it's some 
consistent signal across the two detectors. That's the dark blue recovery there. And you see that it's entirely consistent with that strong assumption that it was from a binary black hole merger. If you just look at what's consistent between the two instruments, you get a reconstruction that looks very, very similar to the strong assumption that it's a gravitational wave from a compact binary in spiral as described by general relativity. So this is just a quick, by eye, but still very convincing argument that not only was it a binary black hole merger, but that it was described exactly by general relativity as we know it. So this is a strong test of general relativity uh, in a completely unique way uh, from anything that had been done before. And that's the, I think, the most convincing one figure summary of why we think this is a binary black hole and why uh, general relativity is doing such a great job of describing it. And the replacement we see the two curves out of the difference in time arrival? That's right. Yeah, so the, in the um, detector paper, in the discovery paper, they showed uh, time split data. So they took the signal in one detector, they took uh, our recovery for the delay time between the two instruments, and they slid the other detector's data by that time just to show the overlap and how well they agreed with one another. But we can visually see it here. Yeah, so here you can see it. This is the data as it was recorded, and the only thing that we've done to this data is whiten it. So we've taken, um, you remember that strain that I showed, that um, sensitivity plot? We had more noise at low and high frequencies than we did at 100 hertz. Uh, the whitening process for this data is you take that data, you go to the frequency domain, you get a curve like that, and you basically just uniform, make the, the noise uniform at all frequencies. So you just reduce the contrast at the low and high frequencies to make it a nice white noise background. And so the signal you see here is a signal, and on top of it you just see white noise, standard white noise, equal contributions from all frequencies. And that's the only thing we've done to this data to show it in this way. But the time, the time is an absolute, so this delay in time of arrival of about seven milliseconds uh, is what we detected. Yes? So these two oscillations, uh, in some places they seem to be totally out of phase and in other places in phase. How come? Uh, you mean, so, okay, there, there's two effects going on here. There's first the delay in time of arrival between the two detectors. So that seven milliseconds is, is being shown here. There's also a sign flip in the two detectors because the, if you remember the orientation, they're about a 90 degree rotation from one another. So there's a flip in the definition of sign of strain. So if you slide them by seven milliseconds and you flip them over, uh, you, you, you multiply by minus one for one of the detectors, then you get very, very strong overlap uh, of, the, of the two signals. All right, so not only do we get from this full parameter estimation the, this right, nice, robust extraction of what the signal was, we also get estimates for all of the parameters that go into our model. So this is a very complicated uh, representation of a probability density function. So probability of all of the parameters. Uh, and the y-axis here is just showing our estimates for each individual parameter. And then down here just shows you that not only are we getting individual parameter estimates, we're accounting for correlations between parameters. So things like distance, which affects the amplitude of the gravitational wave signal. You move the source further away, the amplitude goes down. Inclination can also affect amplitude. It's loudest when it's face on, and if we start to tilt the orbit with respect to our line of sight, then the amplitude goes down. So when we try to estimate distance, we need to account for our uncertainty and inclination, and that's what we do with our full parameter estimation. We're actually uh, evaluating this 15-dimensional function to account for all of those kinds of correlations. What is the orbit versus the absence of the, of the previous slide? Oh, going back. Yeah. So the. You're asking for the, the y versus the x. So yeah, each, each one of these, it, each row in each column is corresponding to a parameter in our model. Oh, I and see. So oh, say oh. this, uh, let's see, where are we? So here is distance and inclination. So uh, this, this uh, row here is all inclination. This okay. column is distance. And that's showing some degeneracy between distance and inclination. So it's just picking two parameters at random from our model and showing what the degeneracy is. And the correlation between them. And the relation between them, exactly. Okay. And you can, you can say approximately what the inclination is? Yeah, so the, uh, I can show a figure in a bit, but um, we basically, we have very little ability to measure inclination by itself. The problem is that it's, it is so degenerate with distance. Um, so when you, we, we basically, we can, we can constrain to a V shape in distance and inclination because we can take some source, we can put it at some inclination, we can move it further away and incline it, and it's completely consistent with the data we've measured. So we get a very degenerate measurement of what distance is, and it's correlated with our estimate for inclination. Um, so the only way that we can actually start to measure inclination meaningfully is if we have multiple detectors with antenna patterns that aren't aligned. Because our two detectors are so aligned, 
That means we only see basically one polarization of gravitational waves. Um, I had said that distance and inclination have basically have the same effect on the signal. You move it further away, the amplitude goes down. You incline it, the amplitude goes down. But when you incline it, you actually change the, the relative contributions to the two polarizations of gravitational waves. So we have H plus and H cross. You start to turn a knob on the relative amplitudes of H plus and H cross when you incline it. So if you're sensitive to more than just one polarization of gravitational waves, then you can start to actually measure inclination. Um, but with the two detectors in the US that are basically aligned, we can't measure two polarizations, we only measure one. When Virgo comes online, then we can make actual estimates of inclination, and that will cause better constraints on our measurements of distance. So from those, that 15-dimensional probability function, we can uh, marginalize over. We can basically account for all the uncertainties and all the parameters except for one, like the mass, and then we can get that number. We can quote the, the estimate for the mass accounting for all of the possible degeneracy between parameters. And that's what goes into our big table that was in the, the um, discovery papers. So you can look at, we actually had two models here. So these columns correspond to different models for what the gravitational waves look like. We called one EOBNR and one IMR phenomenon. And the, the difference is, basically, the math that goes into producing these models um, are equally well motivated. So this one is describing the gravitational waves from a compact binary where the spins of the black holes are aligned with the orbital angular momentum. So there's no misalignment of the spins, there's no precession like I've showed in previous lectures. Um, it's just a, a, a nice, robust model for the individual uh, contributions of spins of the black holes. This one doesn't model the spins, IMR phenomenon does not model the spins of the black holes completely independently. It does this mass weighted combination of spins but it does allow for precession. It allows for misalignment of the component spins from the orbit uh, of, the, of the compact binary. So then you can get wobbling of the orbital plane. You can get modulation of the uh, gravitational wave, like I've shown before. And so from that, we can get different parameter estimates. Both of them are well motivated. And so that's why we use both of them. It's a way to try to account for what we call systematic uncertainties, which are uncertainties in our parameter estimates that are just due to not having uh, ideal, perfect models. So we take the models that we have best motivated, we run with them, and then we combine our uncertainties to get our overall uncertainty on each of these parameters. So that's an attempt to account for uh, uncertainties in these parameters that are just caused by our imperfect models that we're forced to use. So to first give you a little bit of context where these uh, measurements are starting to come into play, this is an old figure of um, estimates of black hole masses that we have from X-ray binaries. So on the x-axis here, it's showing the mass of the black hole in solar masses. So here's five solar masses, 10 solar masses. And then these bars show the range for the estimate of the black hole mass for a bunch of different uh, x-ray binaries over here. And so notice, the, the thing I want you to take away from this is that you see that the furthest, the most massive object is somewhere around 15. And even with oh, the more updated figure before the detection of GW150914, we basically saw black hole masses in X-ray binaries topping out somewhere around 20 solar masses or so. And here is our estimate for the masses of the black holes in GW150914. So this is showing that degenerate uh, estimate of the two component masses, uh, one of the, the blocks in that big triangle that I showed before. On the x-axis is the primary mass, that's the mass of the most massive black hole in the binary. And on the y-axis here is the secondary mass, that's the less massive object. Now, the primary mass is somewhere between 30 and 40 solar masses, and the secondary is somewhere between 25 and 35 <coughs> solar masses. So these are both heavy black holes compared to that figure I just showed you that topped out somewhere around 20 solar masses. So these are pretty massive objects. We're a little surprised to see such massive objects in our very first detection. It's, it's a little bit inconsistent with the X-ray binaries that we've seen so far. So that hints that either the population of X-ray binaries or the black holes in X-ray binaries are a different population <laughs> from the, uh, those that make these binary black hole coalescences, or that we're just, uh, there's some selection effects at play. So we know that there are some selection effects. The, um, we're more likely to detect high mass mergers than we are low mass mergers. The higher mass makes a louder gravitational wave, and so we can see them further out. So we do expect to detect um, more of the high mass things than, than the low mass things. Uh, but the, on top of that, there's this question of distribution of mass. And so as we detect more signals, we'll start to actually be able to tell uh, what the distribution of black hole masses looks like for compact objects, uh, for compact binaries. And so we're going to start getting into that soon. Yes? In a few slides back in the data table slide, you had the difference between a target frame mass and Oh, the, there was, yeah, yeah. So the, there was detector and source frame masses, that's right. 
So uh, you're, you're wondering what that yeah. what that means? Yeah. So the the um, in in astronomy we have something called redshift for far away things. You basically get uh, the shifting in frequency of light that moves it towards longer wavelengths as it's traveling cosmic distances. For gravitational waves, we get also redshifting, but where that comes into effect for us is our estimate of the masses. So as the gravitational wave travels to us, it gets drawn out in its, uh, in its wavelength. And so when we estimate uh, the masses at the detector with our models, we get redshifted masses. And so we have to correct for the redshift based on our estimates of distance to get the source frame masses. Because of the expansion of the universe. Because of the expansion of the universe, exactly. So this, showing, uh, this is showing here the source frame. <coughs> so this is taking the estimates for masses that we actually extract from the data, and then taking our estimate for the distance and correcting for the redshift that we expect based on standard cosmology. All right, so as I said, these masses are fairly high, and that starts to uh, teach us something about just knowing what these masses are, and knowing also the spins can start to inform us about where these kinds of objects are being formed. Um, so I already talked about that in a previous lecture, so I won't go into details, but uh, the, the two main formation channels we expect for these things could be either in the field, where these are just, a, you have, a, com you have a, a, a normal stellar binary system that goes through its evolution into producing two black holes that eventually merge, and then operates completely independently of other stars around it. And then there's the cluster formation scenario, where we have a very, very dense uh, stellar cluster, uh, like a globular cluster, we have tons of black holes that are at very high density, interacting with one another all the time, and that binary forms through dynamical interactions where you can have a third black hole that carries away energy and momentum so that you can cause a, a binary to be formed and merge, and that's a completely different formation scenario. But from these masses, we can already start to say meaningful things about the formation uh, scenario that led to them. So we can't tell yet uh, whether we think that this was formed in the field or formed in a cluster. It's about equally likely for the two. We can come up with lots of ways where they could form uh, a system like we detected could form in a field or in a binary or in a dense stellar cluster. But what we can start to inform are models of wind and metallicity. So as a star evolves, it's shedding mass all the time through winds. And the winds can carry away some fraction of the star's mass as it evolves from the main sequence to eventually becoming a black hole. Uh, I've gone into uh, details of stellar uh, evolution in a previous lecture, so if you, haven't, if you haven't seen it, please just go to the, the slides online and you can, you can take a look. Um, as it evolves off the main sequence, it will shed some amount of mass due to winds, and the amount of mass that it sheds is dependent on the metallicity of the star. So as you have a more metal-rich star, that means that winds will carry away a larger fraction of its mass. And so if you have too high of a metallicity, you will lose too much mass uh, over the evolution of the star to have a star at the end of its lifetime that's massive enough to produce a 30 solar mass black hole. So these blue and red uh, regions are showing our mass estimates for the two objects that were in GW 150914. And this curve here on blue is showing a model for what winds would look like based on a, the metallicity of the star. And so this is as a fraction of solar metallicity, of uh, metallicity like the sun. So here is a star that is, uh, has the same metallicity as the sun. Here is a star that has about 0.1 of the metallicity of the star, one-tenth of the metallicity of our sun. And we can show that we basically need low metallicity to describe, uh, to get black holes that look like the ones that we saw in GW 150914. So that we know that, it formed, that these black holes formed in an environment that was at least half of our, our sun's metallicity, if not uh, lower. And so that's something that, even from just this one event, we were actually surprised that we could start doing interesting astrophysics like that from just this first event. So I uh, talked a lot about localization. We got lucky with this one. It was so loud and in such a weird part of the sky with respect to our antenna patterns that we could actually do a pretty good job of constraining where the source was on the sky. Um, if you just think of uh, delay time and you're doing triangulation, just kind of standard tri uh, triangulation on the sky from the delay and time of arrival, we would only be able to constrain this source to a ring on the sky. Uh, basically a ring of constant delay time in the two instruments. Um, so this is showing part of that ring, but we actually rule out a large fraction of that ring just from the, uh, the smaller effect of the relative amplitude in the two detectors. It's a little bit weaker in Livingston than in Hanford, and then a little bit in the polarization content of the, of the gravitational waves. So here is that distance inclination degeneracy that we were talking about before. So on the x-axis is the inclination, it's the orientation of the binary. On the far left is a binary that's face-on. 
uh, and the middle is edge on, and then on the far right is tail on. So the, uh, just rotating it all the way around so the angular momentum is facing away from us versus toward us, with face on versus face off. And then on the y axis,